Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. A doctor, a lawyer, and an engineer are all sentenced to death via the guillotine. The executioner tells the men, if I pull the lever and the blade does not drop, you're free to go and your sentence will be counted as paid in full. As the doctor stepped up to the guillotine, the executioner asked him, would you like to be face down or face up? The doctor replied, I'll go face up. It won't matter. The executioner pulled the lever, but nothing happened. And he told the doctor, I guess you're free to go, and he was released. The lawyer stepped up to the guillotine. The executioner asked, would you like to be face down or face up? He said, I'll go face down. I don't want to see when it happens. Once again, the executioner pulled the lever and nothing happened. The lawyer was told he's free to go, and he was released. The engineer walked up to the guillotine. The executioner asked him, would you like to be face down or face up? And the engineer responded, eh, why not? I'll go face up. As the executioner reached for the lever, the engineer cried out, wait, wait, wait. I think I see the problem. <laughs> like this joke, had three men with three different professions. Paul challenged the church to carry out their service like three different types of people soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. Each of these fields has a consequence to them, and they all point forward to a time when we will stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 read, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. In this section of Scripture, the Apostle Paul cites three vocations to illustrate to Timothy how he should carry out his ministry and his faithful stand for the truth. And the first thing that Paul tells Timothy is that he should endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul often refers to the Christian life and service as warfare. This is because the Christian life and ministry it's not a playground. It's a battlefield where battles are being won and lost in a real spiritual warfare. Paul desired that in the good fight of the faith in that warfare, that Timothy adopt the focus, perseverance, and courage of a soldier. And it isn't just any soldier that Paul has in mind here. Paul does not exhort Timothy to be a common, ordinary, everyday soldier, but to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. All soldiers may not be good soldiers. When the bullets start flying and the battle gets difficult, there are those who courageously stand and stay in the fight, and there are those who let fear overwhelm them and they pull back and shrink away. Later in this letter, Paul gave an example of a bad soldier, Demas, who lost his focus on Christ and pleasing him, and he did not endure hardship in the ministry. Instead, he loved this present world and departed unto Thessalonica. Paul wanted Timothy to be a good soldier in the sense of being noble, useful, brave, and a model of discipline. And Timothy was to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Timothy belonged to Christ, and he was to engage in the spiritual warfare for him. A good soldier named Joshua in the past once met Jesus Christ, the commander of the host of the Lord. And Joshua 5 says this, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. 
And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. In recognition of his commander's awesome authority, Joshua then fell on his face to the earth and did worship. The Almighty, the Lord of glory, is our commanding officer, and he's the one we serve and owe total obe obedience to as a soldier within his army. To be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, we must, as verse 1 challenges us, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. A good soldier is one who is obedient to their commander-in-chief and who is empowered by and is strong in his grace. And by that grace, Paul challenges Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier. Regarding the words endure hardness, Kenneth Wiest pointed out that in the original Greek, it is a sharp command given with a military snap and curtness. Ministry and taking a stand for the truth in the spiritual battle involves hardship. And we are commanded by the Holy Spirit here to endure it as good soldiers. It's been said well that the measure of a good soldier is not how much he can give, but how much he can take. And God wants us to take the hardships of the spiritual battle and to endure through them. And a willingness to accept an assignment of hardship and trouble and then to endure through it is the mark of a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In verse 4, Paul shows how a deployed soldier is severed from the normal affairs of civilian life. And so a good soldier of Jesus Christ must also refuse to allow the things of this world to distract him as he serves. A good soldier avoids entangling himself in distractions so he can focus his energy on accomplishing the goal established by his commanding officer. The word entangleth is an interesting word. It refers to weaving and twisting together, to entwine and intertwine. It is to twist or interweave in such a manner as to not be easily separated. And it refers to the act of getting so involved in something that one then becomes caught, restricted, and controlled, no longer free to do what one should do. Like a good soldier, we are to have a singleness of purpose and unquestioning obedience to our Lord so that we may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We are to remain free from the entanglements of other lesser goals than that. A good soldier of Jesus Christ is to not entangle himself with the affairs of this life in the sense that we are not allow the things of this world to cause to be, us to be controlled by them to for us to be ensnared by them or to take the focus of our life away from Christ and from pleasing Him. As our Lord said in His earthly ministry, no man can serve two masters. Christ does not want the affairs of this life and this world to be our master, but rather that our deepest devotion and steady focus be to faithfully serve and please Him. Enduring hardship in the good fight of the faith, not being entangled and distracted by the affairs of this life, keeping our focus on Christ and pleasing Him. These are issues that will be raised when we stand before our commanding officer one day at the judgment seat of Christ. These things affect the rewards or loss of rewards that will be decided at that day. To please Christ in this life means that at the judgment seat in the future, we will be rewarded by him because he's pleased with us. But to displease Christ will result in the loss of reward at that day. 2 Timothy 2, 5 reads, And if a man also strive for masteries, 
Yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. From the figure of a soldier, Paul turns to that of an athlete. The words strive for masteries is the Greek word athleo, from which we get our English word athlete. The word means to contend in the games or compete in a contest. Athletes strive, contend, and compete with great determination to win. They deny, control, and discipline themselves in order that they might put forth a maximum effort in their event to compete their best and win the prize. The Christian life is compared with an athletic competition here, not because we are competing against each other in the church. Rather, this analogy challenges the church to serve with the effort, self-control, and determination of an athlete who is going for the prize, that we might complete the race that God has given us and then be re rewarded at that day. But Paul gives a serious warning here that these athletes that give a full effort is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? The word strive lawfully means to compete according to the rules of the event. Those who compete to win their contest and gain the crown must conform to the rules. To be a good athlete, yes, it requires dedication, self-control, and effort, but it also requires abiding by the rules. Break the rules and they would not be crowned as a victor in the games no matter how hard they train, no matter how much effort they put into their event. All of an athlete's hard work and discipline would be wasted if he or she fails to compete according to the rules. This is a call to obey the word of God in the pursuit of spiritual victories and gaining the crown at the judgment seat of Christ. The rules or instructions for the spiritual race we run in this life are found in the Word of God. And like 2 Timothy 2.15, just a few verses later, tells us, God's Word must be rightly divided. To do so, we will then strive lawfully or according to the rules for this current dispensation. Paul is saying that spiritual activity and service must be conducted within the directives of sound doctrine. Like an athlete breaking the rules of their event, to defect from the true doctrine for the church today is to not strive lawfully and will result in not being crowned. For example, many are not striving lawfully today because they try to live by 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That passage puts a yoke of bondage on any who try to live by it. It will hinder one's Christian life under grace. To try to apply this verse to your life today is to not strive lawfully or according to the rules of the race for this dispensation. To live your life in a constant state of fear, always attempting to confess your sins, worrying about overlooking a sin, thinking you might not have uh, confessed them all, you might not be forgiven, you might be in danger of hell, is to not compete according to the rules of this age of grace. God gave 1 John 1, 9 to Israel according to the terms of the gospel of the kingdom. That verse is not written to the church, the body of Christ, and it does not apply to us today. Today, according to the gospel of God's grace, we are set free from all of our sins. The moment we trust that Christ died for us and rose again, all of our sins, past, present, and future, they are paid for, they're gone, they're forgiven, they're washed away by Christ's shed blood the moment you believe. We run the race knowing all our sins have been forgiven in Christ, that we are reconciled to God, that we are redeemed and we belong wholly to Him. We then run with a full effort in the strength of God's grace out of gratitude that we are complete in Christ and we serve Him with all our heart 
to bring honor to our Savior. In our service to God, this analogy teaches us to serve like a dedicated, disciplined athlete who gives a strong and determined effort when they compete to win their prize. But also like an athlete, we are to serve in accordance with God's rule for the current age of grace, the instructions laid out in His Word that are found in Paul's letters. And as we run the race of life in this way, we will be crowned at the judgment seat. 2 Timothy 2.6 reads, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Diligent toil and faithful service is the issue when Paul speaks of the husbandman or farmer in verse 6. As we know, these are the hallmarks of the farmer. It's sunup to sundown labor for a farmer, fertilizing, plowing, planting, weeding, protecting, harvesting, storing, transporting, selling, and so on. Paul knew the value of hard work in the ministry, comparing himself with the apostles and all of the witnesses of Christ's resurrection, Paul could truthfully say, I labored more abundantly than they all. Warren Wearsby stated the following, Young ministers often visited the great British preacher G. Campbell Morgan to ask him the secret of his success. When someone inquired of him what he told these aspiring pastors, Morgan replied, I always say to them the same thing work, hard work, and again work. Timothy and his service also needed to be like the husbandman that laboreth. Paul is urging Timothy to not be lazy or idle, but to work faithfully in his ministry and to do so with a view toward the future in the harvest at the judgment seat. Soldier has the reward of pleasing his commanding officer. The athlete has the reward of a victor's crown. The farmer's investment of sweat and toil earns him the reward and right to be first partaker of the fruits and to enjoy its bounty. Paul is teaching here that labor must precede reward, that if a man would reap, he must sow. Faithful toil and hard work for a farmer results in the reward of a bountiful harvest. Likewise, faithful toil and hard work in our service to God will result in fruits, the fruits of an eternal reward at the judgment seat. As 1 Corinthians 3.8 states, Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Timothy's work of faith and labor of love for Christ could never go unnoticed by God. And Paul is encouraging Timothy to continue to persevere, to be faithful in his toils, living in light of the day when we will all stand before the Lord to give an account. As he did, like the hardworking farmer has the right and blessing to first partake of his crops, Timothy would rightfully reap the reward and blessings from the fruit of his labor. Paul encouraged the Corinthians to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. As we faithfully labor and toil for the Lord in our service and our stand for the truth, we know our labor is never in vain, and we will reap rewards from Christ at that day. The truths from these verses are wrapped up in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, like a good soldier who keeps his focus on his commanding officer to please him. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, like a farmer, who labors and works hard to produce a good crop, rightly dividing the word of truth like an athlete that strives lawfully and complete, competes according to the rules for the games. 2 Timothy 2, 7-10 read, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. 
Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul says for preaching good news, the gospel, the good news concerning Christ and his resurrection, I suffer as though I was a doer of evil and a criminal deserving of prison. Timothy has told this so that he might expect the same as he preached Paul's gospel. But like Paul, he was to be comforted with the truth that the word of God is not bound. While the messenger may be in chains, Paul says, there are no chains that you can put on the message of God's word. Its power and truth cannot be contained. And though he suffered this trouble as an evildoer, and though he was in this dark dungeon, Paul wrote that he was willing to endure all things for the elect's sake. Because if it made his message more powerful, that he was willing to suffer, go to prison, face death for it, and as a result, believers were helped and challenged and encouraged to make a strong stand, he was more than willing. To endure. The final three words of verse 10 hold the key to understanding this somewhat difficult passage. First, the elect's sake. The elect is a term of identification with Christ. In Isaiah 42 1, Christ is called the elect of God. When we trust Christ as our Savior, we are united to Him. And we are in Christ, who is the elect of God. Thus, to be called the elect in Scripture is a term synonymous with a believer's identification with Christ and being in Christ. When Paul wrote that the elect, or believers, may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory, he's not just talking about believers being saved and going to heaven, he had a greater burden that they would go to heaven with these last three words, with eternal glory. Paul is saying that if his suffering led believers to have greater boldness, a stronger stand, and labor more for Christ, and thus result in more rewards and eternal glory for these believers, he says, I'm more than willing to endure all things for that to be so. 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13 read, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Speaking of eternal glory, Paul then wrote concerning the glory of the believer's eternal reigning position with Christ in heaven. When Paul wrote that this is a faithful saying, it means that he's stating a truth that is significant, trustworthy, and sure. And first, he says, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. This is true of every believer. We died with Christ when we trusted Him as our personal Savior. At that moment of faith in Christ, immediately the Holy Spirit spiritually joined and identified us with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. This is a spiritual reality that we know is true by faith in God's Word. Having died with Christ, being complete in Him, being joined to Christ's resurrection in life, we know that we will live with Christ eternally in heaven. Thus, in this comforting, faithful saying, we find that a believer's salvation is assured. However, in what position the believer will live with Christ in heaven for eternity, that's what Paul goes on to talk about. Because there are degrees of reigning with Christ in eternity. He wrote, if we suffer, and as you take that in the context of 2 Timothy, it means 
if we endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, if we suffer trouble, even as an evildoer like Paul did, or if we are partakers of the afflictions of the gospel, if we live godly in Christ Jesus and suffer persecution, as Paul wrote of all these things in this letter, then we shall also reign with him. So if we take a stand for the truth of Paul's gospel, we serve as a good soldier in the spiritual battle, we remain faithful, we suffer for the truth, we will reign and be granted the eternal glory of a higher reigning position in heaven that will be determined at the judgment seat of Christ. But then as he says, if we deny him, or if we are not a good soldier of Jesus Christ, if we do get entangled with the affairs of this life, and like Demas, we love this present world, we depart from the faith. If we are ashamed of the testimony of our Lord and of Paul, his prisoner, if we turn our ears from the truth, then he will also deny us. If we turn away from the truth, if we turn to the world and we depart, if we deny Christ and we're ashamed of Paul and the message Christ committed to him, then he will deny us the eternal glory of a higher reigning position in heaven. And the unfaithful believer will suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. But then Paul reassures the believer that even if we believe not, or are faithless, or are unfaithful to Christ, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Even when believers fail the Savior, he never fails us. And he remains faithful to his word, and he remains faithful to us. Christ cannot deny what he has promised us, and he will never abandon us, because this would be contrary to his nature and his perfect faithfulness. Thus, Christ is faithful to his word, as you go right back to the beginning of this saying, that if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. What this faithful saying is telling us is that every believer in Christ will live with Christ in heaven. But it's up to each individual believer in their stand for Christ, whether they will live with him in the eternal glory of a higher reigning position. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.